Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Charlotte County Libraries and History, Local History. My name is Jennifer Zobelein and I am here today at the General Federation Women's Club Port Charlotte in honor of the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment that granted women the right to vote. And this was a long fight. What I want to do today is talk a little bit about that movement on a national scale, talk about the history of that movement, and then talk a little bit about what that looks like in Florida and, and even here in Charlotte County. So if we begin during the American Revolution, 1776, the Declaration of Independence is signed and sent out uh, for, for all Americans to read. And in that declaration, right, very famously, it says all men are created equal. And it's interesting because at the time, Abigail Adams, wife of John Adams, famously says, remember the ladies. So even in 1776, there is this idea that as this new country is being created with the Declaration of Independence, with the U.S. Constitution in 1789, that women need to be part of the discussion. Unfortunately, this is not what's going to happen. Women do enjoy some level of voting rights prior to 1776 and even after 1776. New Jersey famously allowed women to vote up until 1807, but really after that date, there is no state in the new United States that allows for women to vote. And this fits in with a broader understanding of men and women's place in the country at the time. The idea of separate spheres, the idea that women were meant to be in the home, they were not meant to be involved with nasty things like politics, right? That was for men. Uh, women also do not have an identity of their own. You are either the property of your father or you were the property of your husband. And what we see by the 1820s and into the 1830s are women who start to challenge this, women who start to advocate in favor of women's rights. And voting is not yet on the table, but the idea of women being their own individuals, right? That, that's really how things get started. In 1848, and I know we're fast forwarding a little bit, but right, we do have to move through time fairly quickly here. In 1848, this is going to be a major event, the Seneca Falls Convention in New York. And this is the first time that women's suffrage is actually mentioned as an agenda item of this growing women's rights movement. And at this event, we have women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, right? The very famous figures that we often associate with the women's rights movement. But we also have to remember that there are women like Sojourner Truth, right? Others who are supporting this and who are advocating in favor of women's rights, but also now in women's suffrage. Because voting was seen to be a way to influence right, political power, right? So voting is linked to power. Voting is linked to citizenship. So how can you truly be a citizen, a full citizen, if you do not have the right to vote? So that's really why this becomes such a big issue uh, as we move on into the middle half of the 19th century. Now, 1861, you have the outbreak of the Civil War, and all thoughts of women's suffrage are put on hold in favor of abolitionism, right? Pushing for uh, bringing about the end of slavery, which will come about in the at the end of the Civil War in 1865, and then in the immediate post-war period, advocating in favor of rights for African Americans. And this is actually going to split the movement, right? The, the women's rights movement and, and women's suffrage barely had been on kind of a one track until this point, but now is going to go in multiple directions. And there are disagreements uh, not just between uh, white and black women, but white women north and south. And, and we don't have time to go into all of this, but it is important to note that this is not a one track movement. This is not a single source movement where everybody's on the same page because they're not. And, and so we wanna think about it in a very uh, diverse way. We wanna think about not just Anthony and Stan, but we wanna think about some of these other women. We wanna think about Ida B. Wells, who emerges not just as an advocate of women's suffrage, but a civil rights leader, an anti-lynching advocate, right? We wanna think about Mary Church Terrell, an African-American woman, very educated, who again, pushing not just for women's rights, but for civil rights. And I think that's important to keep in mind 
that African-American women have multiple goals here. It's not just about getting the vote. It's about getting equal rights in society, right? Not just in politics. Now, by 1890, these various elements of the suffrage movement will, will kind of come back together, uh, though there is still uh, discrimination, uh, right? You do still have uh, primarily white, middle-class, upper-class women in the leadership and, and not really allowing African-Americans to participate at the higher levels of leadership in these organizations. But nonetheless, uh, the women largely come together under the National American Woman Suffrage Association. Very long, yes, I know. Uh, and this is in 1890. And at the same time that this is occurring on the national level, in Florida, you have some of the earliest suffrage organizations. Now, organization in Florida was not as organized as you see on the national level or even in some other states, but you do see kind of some early women's organizations that come together and create organizations favoring suffrage, pushing forward this idea of the right to vote, but also women's rights in general. Uh, but it's not going to quite gain momentum yet. Uh, that, that's soon to come. And really, um, you know, the final 20 years, so say 1900 to 1920, these are really, this is, you know, that's a long time. 20 years, we think, wow, that's a long time for people to, you know, gain momentum up to that ratification. But in fact, those 20 years are going to be very central uh, to bringing home the final goal. And this is really when you see an increase uh, of activity on the national level and on the state level as well. You have individuals like Carrie Chapman Catt who comes to lead the National Association group. You have someone like Alice Paul who is initially with NASA, as the very long organization is known, um, and who will help organize a parade in Washington, D.C. in 1913, but then will splinter off and form her own organization, the Women's Party, because she favors a more radical approach. At the same time, right, we have African American women, Native American women, Asian American women who have their own local clubs, their own local organizations, right? Things like the NAACP. Uh, you have the National, National Association of Colored Women. All of these organizations, right? But trying to come together for that final goal, that right, uh, that right to vote. When World War I breaks out in 1914, the United States does not get involved immediately. But in 1917, when the U.S. enters the war, Carrie Chapman Catt and NASA decide that their strategy is going to be, we are going to fully support the war, and this is going to give us the vote. We are going to prove to men, we're going to prove to those legislatures, we're going to prove to the president that women deserve the right to vote. And I think this is an important point to, to think about. Women had to convince men that they, des they deserve that right to vote. This was not something that was just going to be accepted out of nowhere, right? Again, if we think about the decades long struggle here, the primary opposition are men because men do not believe women belong in politics. They don't believe women belong in a public realm, right? But by 1917, 1918, some of those social barriers are starting to break down. And so you do start to see more success at the state level. There are states that by 1918 allow women to vote, again, at the state level, right? But the big goal here is that federal amendment, right? To get this to where it is a national requirement that women cannot be denied the right to vote. So finally, 1918, you start to see this come up in multiple Congress, sessions of Congress. Finally, by 1919, it actually passes. It passes the House in May of 1919, and it passes the Senate on June 4th, 1919. So once this amendment, the ninth, what, is, what will become the 19th Amendment, passes both the House and the Senate in Congress by June of 1919, now it can be sent to the states. And like all constitutional amendments, this requires three-fourths of the states to vote yes. 
right? They have to ratify this in order for it to become law, for it to become part of the Constitution. At the time, there are 48 states. That means 36 states have to ratify this for it to, for it to become uh, part of the Constitution. There are less than half of that uh, whose states allow women to vote on that state level, right? So this is going to be no easy task. So as difficult as the fight to get to that ratification point is, this last stretch, that last year, is going to be just as challenging, right? And yes, there are some easy states that, you know, go, go in right away and that accept this, and then it starts to slow down a little bit. But by March of 1920, there are 35 states that have ratified. They need one more. One more. So where's the final fight going to be? It's going to end up being in Tennessee. Not necessarily the place that women would have wanted, right? This is a border state, right? It had sent men to serve in the Union and the Confederacy during the Civil War, but many see it as a Southern state. Many see this as a place that is not favorable to women's suffrage, that is not favorable to African-American rights, but they have no choice, this is it. Many other Southern states had rejected the 19th Amendment, right? So the, they, the state legislature meets and it's rejected. Florida is not going to reject it outright. In fact, they actually don't call a legislative session at all, right? And, and there are several other states that do that as well. Florida, by the way, Florida will not ratify the 19th Amendment until 1969. Now, women in Florida have had the right to vote since 1920, but they didn't actually officially ratify it at the state level until 1969, right? So those states are all out, and so it's Tennessee. So in August of 1920, the fight comes to Tennessee, and the women are pulling out all the stops. They are doing everything they can to convince these men in power, this is what you need to do. You have, you know, this, and, and here's why. Here's all the reasons why you need to do this. It ends up being very close. The Tennessee Senate passes it fairly easy. The vote's 24 to 5. In the Tennessee House, it looked like this was going to fail. It looked like this was going to, you know, to have come so far and, and to have lost in the end. But on August 18, 1920, 100 years ago today, the Tennessee House votes yes by one vote. So by one vote, 36 states have now ratified the 19th Amendment and women are officially granted the right to vote under the Constitution. Now, this is not the end of the story. Yes, this is a huge, momentous event. It's a huge, momentous occasion. And women across the country are celebrating. Uh, black women, white women, everyone is celebrating, but also everybody understands that there are still limitations. African American women understand that because of Jim Crow in the South, they're still going to have to put up the fight. Right? They still have to continue to push for equal rights, for to end discrimination. And in fact, African American women, along with African American men, will not have full voting rights throughout the country until the 1965 Voting Act. Native American women will not get the right to vote until Native Americans are made full citizens under the law in 1924. Asian American women will not be granted the right to vote in this country until 1952 when all Asian Americans are formally made citizens, right? And Alice Paul recognized this, right? She continued the fight. She recognized the importance of suffrage, but she continued that fight forward, right? Here in Florida, women, just because Florida did not ratify that amendment in 1920, Floridian women are not going to let that stop them. Floridian women will be running for office. The first woman to be elected to the state legislature will be in 1929, right? Uh, and even today, in the Florida uh, legislature, the House and the Senate are each comprised, 30% each, of women. So women are here. Women are on the stage. Uh, it's, you know, it was a long fight. And the fight continued after 1920, and the fight continues today, right? But nonetheless, very important that we celebrate this very important event in American history, uh, and that we remember it for a culmination of a decades-long struggle uh, and also a turning point uh, in mo granting more equality, gender equality, racial equality in the country as a whole. As a whole.
So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and please tune in next time. Uh, in September, we will be at the Military Heritage Museum speaking about the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. Thank you so much.